Um, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming for amazing turnout. Um, this is our third and I think final um, um, outside guest for the for the term. We have uh, the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Dominique Somda um, to speak today. Um, Dominique is has been based at Humor for the last um, two and a half to three years. Um, she has a well, she, well. She'll tell you more. She has a fascinating biography and also itinerary of scholarship that has taken her from a PhD in Paris to a postdoc at the London School of Economics and some teaching uh, in the US, where she actually is planning to return uh, very soon. Um, Dominique's work, for those of us who were included and um, who, who, who got a chance to read, a fascinating work on, on afterlives of slavery um, and looking at what happens to societies um, and really adding, you know, a whole lot of complexity to the question of identity, secret, secrecy, um, tying in questions of geography um, and urban space. So her work is like a fascinating look at, um, yeah, the complex um, and multi-layered history of, of slavery in Madagascar and the afterlives of that. And I think in that way, um, it's a great, um, if, uh, having Dominique is a great um, follow on actually from last week, um, where we were looking at, uh, you know, other questions of uh, yeah, dispossession and uh, uh, yeah, actually forms of enslavement in South Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique, for joining us. And yeah, 45 minutes and then we will. <laughs> thank you so much, Shai. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very, very happy and excited to be here today. That's my first time here on campus uh, in Stellenbosch. I've been uh, actually, I think, at Huma for a little longer. I was just I was just stuck in Paris and doing Huma from, from Paris for, for a little while, but I've been around here for almost three years now. And that's my first time here. But uh, you know, the talk that I'm presenting today is actually based on an article that I developed uh, not very far from here uh, in the Montfleur, um, Montfleur, what's it called? Uh, Montfleur Center, where Yuma has regular disobedience um, workshops uh, for and at them for two years and uh, between 2000. 2022 and 2023. So actually, if it's my first time here, like th those ideas come from just around the corner. Um, and uh, this during this workshop, it was um, it was question of uh, challenging collectively the kind of research that we produce as African scholars um, to try to liberate ourselves from. Uh, from some of the knowledge that was handed down to us and uh, uh, my kind of uh, the frontier in because later on is um, it's a proposal to ground uh, my intellectual project uh, in anthropology. I, I'm an anthropologist and also in African studies in general. So for those of you who, who don't know me and I guess like uh, I think I know a little bit Claire because uh, Claire was my colleague uh, at Huma for a little while, and she that you know that uh, uh, invited me uh, today. Um, like maybe it's not you know you probably don't know like the kind of you know complexity that you know she was uh, was hinting. Uh, so yeah, I I'm so I'm Burkina Bay, uh, Burkina from you know Burkina Faso in West Africa, known as the land of Sankara, but also of all those cool recent coup <laughs> and and I'm also French. Um, I study mostly Madagascar and a bit of Benin where I grew up. So it's a bit of a all over the place. And I so I've been in South Africa for a few years, but uh, before that I've been a black woman in the US for, for, for many years. Um, and working across those geographies uh, as a black uh, as a black woman, an African woman, has also given me a sense or a desire to uh, to discuss and to question the Africa multiple, uh, and that's what uh, this uh, presentation is about today. I center hybridity in my in my title, so of course hybridity denotes a, a process of cultural mixing, often mobilized uh, uh, to analyze places such as the Caribbeans. Uh, Brazil, Mauritius, uh, or the Western Cape, for example. Uh, and um, of course, like, you know, the cultural society produced uh, often by plantation economies uh, and, in, and the diverse mobilities in, in the current cultural societies. So 
the the idea, of course, you know, behind hybrid is that uh, instead of saying uh, identical to themselves and just being juxtaposed, um, like cultures uh, that result from uh, such unconscious, such contact, such spaces of contact, are different from those that came before. Hybridity was used uh, by you know a lot of postcolonial scholars, you know, and like. Uh, Famously by uh, Omi Baba, who was describing a mixture emerging from, from zones of context in the context of colonial hunters. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I'm centering here today about uh, Madagascar. So I want to start with, sorry, uh, what should I do to just jump to the other? OK, I found it. I found it. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I found it. Um, so I want to question with the what if. I'm kind of a, science, a fan of science fiction, and 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 you know this is a kind of modality of writing in science fiction. So I'm starting like that proposition with a what if. So African is often essentialized, even by even in Africa and by Africans, and um, you know like the you know thinking of Africans as you know, a kind of collection of discrete ethnic groups with their own languages and boundaries. Uh, we think about, you know, African language, but also African philosophy, and more specifically sometimes about Yoruba religion or Zulu uh, philosophy, etc. So even, uh, you know, when we historicize borders, uh, and we have done that for a long time here, right? We have done, we have read the work and maybe not here, but like in my uh, Francophone context, we read uh, Jean-Louis Amzel uh, that has written um, Mesitologic and he has uh, written with a, a Congolese French author, Elieke uh, Mbokolo, uh, a text that that is, I think I would translate in English as the ethnic group as an history, you know? So we've read that for decades, right? As a student, 20 years ago, I read that, right? So, and I learned that any groups were like shaped by the colonial counter, that they were not what they were before. I know from my own background, you know, as a, you know, a member of a Dagara group, that Dagara doesn't mean much. There's different names on in Ghana, it's in Burkina Faso, it's maybe from Nigeria, maybe from other places. So, you know, we, we have this sense of history, of course, but even when we historicize borders, uh, and, you know, pointing out that the scramble of Africa, you know, uh, as profoundly transformed relation between ethnic groups, we act as if pre-colonial borders were, that existed before were absolutely, absolutely uh, authentic and, and permanent, right? And that the so social cultural traits were eternal. I propose another alternative to think about, about it, you know? What if Africa existed not you know, in the solidity of the boundaries, but in the interstice, the edges, the, in, the connection between uh, spaces? What if the fragmentary, the mobile, the composite were the rule and not the exception? What if Africa was the, was the name of shared historical experiences and conditions? My what if? is actually an epistemological and methodological proposition that I call frontier ethnography, with, that echoes the critical power of border thinking that is exemplified, for example, I don't know if it's something that you have in your curriculum, but the work of uh, uh, Glo Gloria Anzadola, you know, um, about, that is called like uh, La Frontera. Uh, and that what if is also an invitation to look to the coasts uh, from the islands, from places more, more, most likely to foster the form of hybridity described in the Caribbean and the, in the Indian Ocean. So my what if is very also uh, personal in the sense that my what if come from, from, from you know, the, uh, like, you know, from the experience of being a scholar of Madagascar uh, and a place that is an island on the edge, you know, uh, outside of, of, you know, away from the, from the continent. So, Madagascar, who has done uh, anthropology for the last 20 years, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's at the center of this. But it's also a reflection on other places where I lived and worked, you know. Uh, Benin, for example, in the coastal coast of Benin, that is, you know, also a very hybrid place. 
as a result of the slave trade and the you know, ex continuous exchange between, for example, Brazil, IT, and, 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 um, and Benin. Um, it's a very complex place here is also a very uh, uh, such a place you know and and we can discuss and I think we I, I think yeah we had like a, just just now we had a yeah there's a, there's a connection between of course that what Madagascar is and what the Western Cape is because there's a there's a there, there has been of course this displacement from say from Madagascar to the Western Cape so so you know a, a, lot, a lot of a lot of places where I have connection. Uh, but Madagascar in particular is good to think because it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex island that is often excluded for understanding of what Africa is. Africa is undeniably an African island. It's close, it's, a, it's on the coast of Africa. Um, it's, it's diplomatically, it's a, it's a member of all of the continental organizations. And yet, you know, um, Africans and, uh, and non-Africans alike you know, often use the phrase Africa and Madagascar, like Madagascar wasn't part of the story. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason, and the reason for denying Madagascar's Africanity is often it's, it's uh, and not just its Africanity, also its blackness. It's often uh, connected to the kind of hybridity that it represents. So the presentation will take me from the examination you know, of, you know, probably like, you know, a world that you know, you know, on the colonial library that defined the study of Africa uh, to foregrounding processes of colonization, which I understand here, not as the study of Creole places, but as a method of pluralizing, like, uh, the, the, the spaces that, you know, are the African space, you know, pluralizing Africa and pluralizing Madagascar. And then the call for a frontier ethnography. So let me start there. Uh, the colonial library, as probably you know, you've learned in, in class and you're reading, is a metaphor used by Congolese uh, philosopher Valentin Mundimbe. In his book, The Invention of Africa, he described the way in which Africa has been constructed as a category by the West. His book is an analysis of the discourse produced uh, in Africa by European uh, explorers, anthropologists. Uh, colonial administrators, cartographers, etc. The colonial library also consists in a very material sense, of course, in, of, in and of the archives that generation of Africanists and Africans also have used. Uh, so you might wonder what the present slide um, is uh, displaying a photo of uh, Joseph Gallieni, and I don't know if there's anybody that is you know, working uh, the, on the French Empire here, but um, this is somebody that is quite famous for his involvement. And let me tell you uh, more about, about him. So uh, Gamini was, uh, was a colonial administrator that did a lot of his career in, in, in the colonies. He was also, uh, he, he ended his career as a maréchal and ministry of war during the First World War in, in France. Uh, so a very, very important figure in, you know, in, in, in France. Uh, in the early uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, is uh, okay. He played a, lo a large part in the pacification of Madagascar, which is why you know I, he's, he's an important figure. Um, so he was a specialist of counter insurrection, and he participated in the in the military conquest of West Africa. Uh, in uh, in the 1980s, he was in the era that is now Senegal and Niger and Mali. He, I don't know, if, again, if you're familiar with West Africa, but he, he fought the likes of Samori Touré in Guinea. Samori Touré was an emperor, a Wasu emperor. Uh, and then somebody also is very famous in the history of West Africa, Amadou Tal, that, he, that was the emperor of Segou in, in current Mali. Like a very important, um, yeah, very important emperor that, that also were, yeah, were leading the anti-French resistance. So, and this is this is okay. This is a book that he has written about Madagascar, but in French it says like nine years in Madagascar. Uh, okay, so Gallieni in the nineties. Okay, so sorry. After that, I forgot. And uh, like the, the next decade, he was in, in the in French in the in the China in the China in the in the Chine Francaise, and uh, he did also he developed he developed there actually like a 
like new ways of, of dominating and conquering the uh, new territories. So in Tonkin, in, in that area of, of, of Asia, he developed uh, a doctrine, a colonial doctrine that is known as the Tashville, uh, oil stain, something like that, I would say in English, and politic de race. Politic de race is a very important concept for anybody that's interested in that period of the French empire. Uh, it's in, it could just translate as racial politics. But when he arrived in uh, Madagascar in 1896, uh, he became le, the Resident General, which is the governor of, of Madagascar. And he focused, uh, contrary to the person that came before, was like Resident La Roche, he, he was not interested in diplomacy. Uh, by that time, you know, like, most, not all of era of Madagascar were, were, you know, dominated by the French, but, you know, uh, they, uh, they were uh, um, able to get rid of the, of the uh, queen. And uh, he, he, de he developed already, like, uh, imp important, like, uh, anti uh, strategy to counter anti-colonial resistance. So he created, for that, he created the racial cartography, to, the idea was that to subject it the most hostile, um, he needed to implement uh, a like, like contradictory action to pick people against, against each other. And he, he, he had you know, contradictory policies. For example, he abolished slavery. And that's important for the kind of conversation that we're going to have after on, that is more on center of my work on, on the afterlife of slavery. So he's responsible for the abolition of slavery. But he also um, decided and uh, generalized forced labor. So he made everybody a slave. Uh, yeah. So Gagnini collected uh, ethnological artifacts from Madagascar, but also from the other places that he, um, that he administered and, and you know, Subjugated. He was is the author of many many um, texts on the different colonial territories, and I, I'm going to come back later um, uh, to the consequence and the implication on that knowledge produced by the not only Gallieni but also the likes of Gallieni. There were like a lot of other Gallienis like during during the the French Empire in Madagascar. But I can already say. Uh, the knowledge we we use as a result of also that production of knowledge was very was of course Eurocentric and hegemonic. It imposed categories and geographies that became the lenses through which um, the African continent, Madagascar, and the African continent uh, uh, were misrepresented. To, know, to the knowledge determined by uh, uh, by Europeans uh, determine how. The Europeans intervene in Africa, but also African, like related to each other, and all Malagashi related to other Malagashi. The history and geography of Africa were taught in, you know, in school textbooks, uh, and you know, even even after, before and even after the the independence of of African universities and and you know curricula. So, what would be the implication and condition of thinking about Africa beyond the colonial library. Uh, it would mean understanding the diverse experience of African Africans through their own categories, reflecting as accurately as possible the complexity and ever-changing realities. It requires finding new archives um, and new territories to unlearn and construct. And to achieve these results, there's a, there's a need to listen to um, voice that where that have been silenced. Um, so, pluralizing Africa and Madagascar. So, what is that project of pluralizing Africa? Uh, to be honest, this is a, this this is this kind of also reflection I have is also like a, a response to um, panel invitation in panel participation uh, to the VAG, the Africanist German Conference that. Uh, was held a few years back. I'm not. I don't. I wasn't there. I was just there remotely, so I have no idea where it was. But, but it it was it was that the, the panel was called Creolizing Africa, and I proposed also like a, my reflection on how to creolize Madagascar. Um. So and it's also like my reflection is also inspired by by works. Uh, uh, on Europe, uh, there's a book, there's a collection of essays that is uh, quite interesting. 
that is entitled Coralizing Europe, and the volume is entitled uh, Edited by uh, Gutierrez Rodriguez and Shirley Ann Tate, if you're interested. So what does Creole mean? Uh, I know you're not, uh, you, this is a term that, that has its importance here as well. Uh, of course, it's uh, it's also, you know, this, this very, a very particular use of the term the Caribbeans or in Louisiana, for example, in the United States or in Mauritius, La Réunion, Seychelles, etc. Um, it indicates a, a, a mixing of sort, but not just a, a, a mixing. There's, there's, a, there's a primary, there's, there's several primary sense of Creole, but one of them is very related to language and to, uh, to language form, formation, right? And that's like a, a, a very um, precise way to use it, like a primary sense of sorts. Um, and in that sense, you know, there's not a lot of Creoles, there, there's not that many Creole space in, on the continent. There are a few of them and they are like, you know, we can identify them quite easily, you know, they, I don't know, I think about Indian Ocean Islands, Cabo Verde, the, the, of the coast of, Madag of, of Senegal and et cetera, et cetera, and a lot of, you know, coastal area in Eastern or Western Africa. Um, and th those places of, are, are related to the history of slavery. Uh, the, what I'm indicating here, and, and I think as I mentioned before, is more of a methodological propo proposition that consists in foregrounding element of hybridity. It's an, I like to call it a prophylactic measure. Uh, and I'm following here, like the, the work of, uh, of uh, anthropologist, Haitian anthropologist, uh, Ralph Michel Trouillot, uh, for, for, for whom um, uh, Creole space, like the Caribbeans and from, you know, Haiti as well, are good at helping us uh, to reject some of the gatekeeping concept that, uh, that are upheld in anthropology. Uh, I'm sure like, you know, uh, you know, like anthropology students here would, you know, be aware that, you know, we, you know, every territory in the world is associated with a few, a few of those gatekeeping con concepts, you know, so uh, I think Trujillo uh, cite a hierarchy in India, and uh, this is, of course, like uh, some kind of, um, you know, uh, an escapable concept and category that, you know, scholars and especially anthropologists of India are, uh, are asked to, to, to address, right? And myself, I'm a big reader of French uh, sociologist and anthropologist Louis Dumont that has written, of course, essay on the hierarchy. And that's what, that was one of my favorite books as an anthropologist and really uh, uh, inspired me, but uh, yet it's also a gatekeeping concept. Uh, there's we can also cite, and I'm adding to to I think to what we were saying, like honor and shame that has characterized the Medjron era. Uh, whenever you hear honor and shame, like oh, you know, <laughs> you know, Morocco, Spain, etc. You know? And of course, you know, like for the students of West Africa, you know, we would think of you know a certain idea concerning the lineage system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are very also present. So those are like the lenses, the category that through which we have to analyze the realities and the complexity and reducing sometimes, sometimes, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, for uh, Africanists and specialists of Madagascar, gatekeeping often meant accepting a limited set of preconceived notions about political formation, kinship system, ancestral cults, and witchcraft, um, to cite a few. Anthropology contributed to the invention of Africa, the, the, the kind of um, uh, epistemological and geology of the knowledge in Africa that Mundibe was, was describing. Uh, the concept uh, on Africa were multiplied through the years of knowledge production and in different academic institutions. They shape what we saw as part of the geographical, social, and cultural fabric of the continent. Denying Africanity to places that were not seen as fitting exactly the established concept or, uh, of what is African and what's not Africa, what is African and who are not Africans, right? Excluding Madagascar, but also places like North Africa, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, or Zanzibar, Sudan, Ethiopia, for similar reasons, right? Uh, in order to carve out a pure, imagined African territory. Oh, okay. This, this is this was I didn't 
I, that that all map doesn't need to be to be commented. <laughs> um, I've mentioned so I've mentioned the hybridity of Madagascar several times, uh, and uh, what is special about it? This is time to say a little more. Uh, Madagascar um, people and peopling the peopling of Madagascar is uh, kind of unique and exceptional and a kind of exceptional example of hybridity. Madagascar is a very large island, and and I repeat that every time I, I've been okay, I've been very. I've been irritated a few times. I don't know. I don't want to say too much, but I've been irritated a few times when people think that Madagascar is the size of Mauritius, right? So that's why there's so many maps. I don't need maps. I just want to make a point. Madagascar is huge. <laughs> and I say that now again and again. So that's you know, so that's Madagascar and that's that's Mauritius, right? It's not the same, it's not the same size. Um so, and even people very close to me, like for years, like told me like, oh, like your work in Mauritius is quite interesting. So I've mentioned um, the hybridity. So yeah, I mentioned that. So uh, Madagascar is both of Asian and, and, and African, like Madagascar people, of, of both Asian and, and, and Madagascar and, and Asian and African uh, ancestry. So like to just give a few ideas of the technologies, you know, today with like a lot of archaeological and like linguistic work, we, we can we know and we know when like people arrived in Madagascar that was very for a long time a, a mystery, a so-called mystery. But like a lot of Madagascar people and the language is the closest to a, lang a language uh, spoken in Borneo, in Indonesia. Uh, so there's a particular people there that speak language that is almost the same as the language uh, spoken in Madagascar. And the language of Madagascar is also it's Austronesian, right, the family. And it's very close to the language uh, uh, that Hawaiian, native Hawaiian are speaking. So if you know, if you see where Hawaii is, that's quite a distance, right? So we say the zone for Austronesian language is from Hawaii in the Pacific to almost the coast of Africa. Thus, I think there's no other language that is not like a recent uh, uh, colonial language that has such a you know, spread, right? It's quite impressive. And it's, you know, it's interesting because when I read my colleagues working in Indonesia, in Malaysia, et cetera, very often I'm like, oh, that's the same word for rice or for dead or for, you know, a lot of words are very uh, are the same. And it's of course a lot of also influence for the Swahili era, a lot of, a lot of you know, Bantu, uh, uh, Bantu element in the language, uh, the, there's also a lot of Arabic, you know, and so it's not it's not just the language, but of course we have now also we we you know we found like object of trade, so we know exactly how was Madagascar in the world system in the Indian Ocean world system. Um, so it's quite and of course of, of course like a lot of Indian elements, right, and a lot of uh, because there was a lot of trade with Gujarat in, in Western India, so so a lot of those. Um, Typical Indian Oceanic, in a way. Typical Indian Oceanic with a little more Australasian. So that's the peopling of Madagascar. Uh, but for more than a century, Madagascar, not Madagascar, Madagascar specialists, it's not the same. Sometimes there's an overlap, but Madagascar specialists of European and American ancestry, our nationality, uh, have debated the origin of the people the language, the vocabulary, the kinship system, ad nauseam, right? Like it's all that they would, they would talk about, you know? Uh, they were the, pro the proponents of African uh, African uh, Madagascar and the proponent of Asian Madagascar. Uh, my supervisor, Maurice Bloch, a, 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 a great anthropologist, uh, specialist of Madagascar, I never set foot in Africa because for him, he wanted to make a point that Madagascar wasn't African, not for any dislike, but just for, for uh, you know, just for, not for, for just like, you know, intellectual reasons. So he didn't want to associate, and that's me, I'm, 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 Maurice, I'm sorry if you hear me, I'm sorry. It's not, it's not a criticism, but it's just, it's just, a, it's just a, a fact that very often we found those, 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 you know, embracing of a geography. Me, I was, I studied with him, but I, as an African, I was like, no, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't believe it. Yeah, it's it's an African island. It's in Africa. It's African. That's it. I know the story. So, 
uh, that so so the, the the question was also the precocity. Which one is the more important? Huh? Um, what what is the most you know influential uh, contribution to the makeup of Madagascar? So they in and in different regions, people were having different different responses, right? So people working the islands were more inclined to insist on the Asian roots. People on, working on the coast were more inclined to, to discuss the African the Africanity of Malagashi. That double uh, connection had significant consequences on the political treatment of social cultural differences in Madagascar. The colonization of Madagascar transformed perceived difference that are phenotypical, behavioral, cultural, and uh, so they merged that with, uh, you know, and historical divisions into racial classifications and um, and political opposition as well. So going back to Gallieni, like the, the French general and the governor of Madagascar, and the, the kind of like, you know, colonial doctrine that is, uh, he has implemented in Madagascar, the politique de has was a divide and conquer situation, right? Uh, so he picked it. The, the 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 dominant at the time the dominant uh, more Indonesian related islander to the more like kind of phenotypically like African but do, you notice that I'm very careful because of course I'm I'm here discussing about you know kind of representation and not reality so um, it's it's just it's just that right so. Uh, in, in French, uh, the word used were, were in French was cotier, and 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 you know, so it's like cotier and gens des hauts plateaux, so islanders, right? And that's a vocabulary and an opposition that's still very important today. People of African descent, uh, people of of uh, you know Asian descent, and and okay, later on when we discuss about slavery in Madagascar, it's also connected to the perception of who is of slave descent. You know, if you're if you're more black in the in Madagascar, in the island, people are going to think that you are son of slave, right? It's like you, if you if you it's, it's it's kind of the association. So there's there's a redundancy, you know, the kind of idea that people who are uh, phenotypically uh, uh, black uh, and with you know curly hair or might suffer from discrimination because of that reason. Right? But the difference that were initiated and reinforced by, you know, the, the colonial administrator and the colonized science has enormous consequences on, you know, the politics of Madagascar today. Uh, in the early 1970s, and I'm giving you a few examples. So in the early 1970s, uh, student and urban movement uh, that uh, kind of where like happened just before and created and produced the socialist revolution in 72, uh, where, you know, kind of animated by um, a group, a group of youth, of young people of perceived uh, African descent and, and slave descent. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, it was a moment of strategic essentialism where people say, we all, us black, you know, we fight against, you know, against the, uh, against you know the, the the oppression of 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 the islanders that were also perceived as um, you know it's very complicated you know there's I could, I could this is a subject myself you know the way you know those islands and those division like were played you know so I'm going to I'm going to just say that but they they rallied against the elite in the capital Antonin uh, uh and they were fighting like you know the white people and white people in the context of Madagascar. They are not people of European descent. Those are like just they are just like people from beyond the sea. Uh, white people in Madagascar are people that are of perceived Asian descent, right? So that's the black and white there. So, and conversely, to give an opposite example of you know how like those opposition have played in the politics in Madagascar in the in the early in the early and late 90s there, there was a very complicated and and violent movement that was ethno nationalist and uh that it, the movement emerged like and in the in the you know the early you know the blood you i don't know a lot of people here were not born then probably but in the 90s there was something like that was called blogs and and i was like pre tiktok and they were very you know they were full of, of like violent conversation 
and uh, and in those in those blogs, you know, like uh, people of um, pe pe people that perceive themselves of, of Asian descent were uh, and white uh, were, you know, defending like their supremacy, their um, cultural and racial superiority. This is very complicated movement, and 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 the discourse were really 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 racist. Like like when I've read those texts, you know, it made me really like, oh, you know, it's like, it's really violent, right? It's not, you know, we can't minimize the violence of that. And they, are, they have been recurring since then, but there was a peak in that in the nationalism that can be explained by many reasons, but uh, that's what happened. So those kind of, you know, re-mobilization of concepts and categories have affected uh, uh, Madagascar deeply. So I want to, I, I reinforce that because there are, there's, there's something at stake, you know, in how we discuss complexity and difference, right? And how we essentialize people. What, what's in those kind of like, you know, uh, violent uh, outcomes or, or what is, you know, the consequence of, you know, conserving and, and re-proposing like colonial um, categories. Uh, so those rationalist discourse uh, are no real precedent in the in, on the island. You know, pre-colonial identities were multiple, changing, and eminently political. Um, not only the emergence of the Asian African distinction, but also uh, the stereotypes of the proverbial 18 ethnic group in Madagascar, a representation that has uh, you know very few um, historical bases. Uh, have you know solidified, and I think I had yeah I had this uh, those images that are contemporary. They are not they are not colonial, but they are like the representation of the eighteen ethnic group. Uh, anybody that spent time in Madagascar, in, you know, know that there's no eighteen. You know, you arrive. I arrived in a place that was called Anouche, supposed to be you know uh, the home of the Tanouche, uh, and and you know, and I found you know like. Like I found, like you know, places that people say, "Oh, it's not exactly that. It's not Anush, it's that or that." And and sometimes it it, it could be. Sometimes it's the it's a it's a place. It's a place that used to be an an, an former kingdom, and it's, it has another name, and blah, blah, blah. so it, 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 there's a overlap of different uh, political units, right? And it's very complex, and certainly nothing that is coincide with that the kind of racial uh, cartography that's actually the approach of colonial the colonial effort and of like the strategy of of again you need to actually have you know certain any groups so that you can tell those people are lazy those people are racist those people are you know um, you know and I, I didn't read the excerpt from from Gladiators behind me but I'm sure that you've seen a few words from it you know so th th there's those idea that you know, you can use like the, per the the perception and the resentment of different people because of the history of the of imperialism also from the from the islands and from the history of slavery to kind of really pit people against each other. So Madagascar is this very unique assemblage of with combined legacies of pre-colonial colonization of Tunisian language and Islamic presence among many 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 others. Is tell me, oh my god, okay. Uh, it seemed very good to think with, right? It's uh, and inside of being caught in that quest that still kind of exists. I'm not going to say because I think we're online, so I'm not going to say too much. But but it's still it's still it's still present in anthropology today, right? Like uh, you know, people who say, oh, that way of thinking about kingship is more African or more Asian, etc. So, but I I feel like instead of um, focusing on separating and like identifying the lineage and the genealogies, et cetera, and rank, rank different uh, influence that are embedded in the history and the, and the geographies of Madagascar, Madagascar should be recognized as a place to think complexity from, ability from, a space that unsettles borders, disrupts classification, and question ideas of what it means to be African. So I was going to say more about, you know, that place where there's no Tanush, but that is called Anush. And Anush in, Madag in Madagascar means island. In Madagascar, it means island. So it's kind of the island in the island, right? It's called, there's a book on uh, a book from the 90s on that region. It's called like an island in the middle of, in the middle of the land. But to be honest, it's also like a coastal region. So it's not, but it's just, just an embedded island, right? And so there's this kind of, um, 
repetition. The isolation of the region, like, is I think is also justifying like the, the fact that we can see it as a, as an island. Um, but what what I wanted to say about about uh, about Anouche, Anouche is a is a frontier, is a quintessential frontier, is a first place that was colonized by the French in the 17th century, with an history that is very close to. Uh, the Western Cape, right? Fort Dauphin, like the capital of, of uh, Anouche, was uh, a colonial post created for, you know, on the way for French and, and on the way to India, right? And it's, so it's it's a very it's a very similar history, very contemporary, you know, like middle of the of the 17th century, and with very different consequences. You know, there's a text by uh, uh, an historian, Pierre Larson, in historian of Mauritius and historian of Madagascar. And he has he has this uh, paper. It's called Colonies Lost, and he he, he kind of draws the parallels between like Cape Town and Fort Dauphin to say that you know like Fort Dauphin is a colony that was lost, you know by by not by you know it, they, it was lost because people killed the French. They killed them. They had to go. It was a massacre, and you know nothing happened then for three centuries. You know uh, French people and any everybody left Madagascar you know alone. And today, for the fans, a very like dormant frontier town, uh, but it could have been Cape Town. It could have been Cape Town. It was. It was. It, 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 what is interesting also, it exactly looked like Cape Town, like the area, like the the kind of landscape, exactly the same. So it's kind of there's a there's an eerie quality to this, like those comparison with those also alternative histories. But okay, so that's that's a, and I'm going to 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 go a little faster. But it's um it's a consequential frontier. Uh, what also is interesting about about uh, about An Tanush and the non Tanush, but the, the resident of Anush, is that they they are they are convinced of their hybridity in a way that is quite interesting. Like the first time, I think one of the, you know when I started like doing research there, you know, I said, oh, you know, as an I said, I was kind of lying, but I said because I, I interested in. I was interested in power, but I said, I'm, I want to study culture. I want to study history, which is another way to, you know, to try to start the conversation. But people were telling me, you're not going to find culture here. There's no pure culture here. You won't find Tanush. There's no pure Tanush here. No tradition, no language. You won't find that here. They said something to me that stuck, you know, in my imagination. They said, and, and they were talking about the village where I wanted to set a little town where I, saw, I wanted to, to establish myself. And they said Manamba, that village, is the United States. What meant that is that it's not, you know, the identity that you try to grasp is crumbling. It's it's a lot of things. It's a, it's a melting pot, but also not, you know, it, the source is not, the mildness is not taking. So it's kind of, you know, like uh, an assemblage of different things. And what he, what it, what it means also is, 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 is that there's, there's this like awareness of, of the multiplicity of what it means to to be there, uh, and that's I think one of also the reason why I've been so attached to conduct that kind of reflection from there, from that place that's that is like uh, you know that people say people say uh, to characterize it, it's 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 mixed. But this is a French word to say mixed, you know, and normally it's used to to talk about people, you know, your mixed race, etc. But then it's everything is mixed there and mixed, like the kinship is mixed. Like the, the the culture is metis, the, uh, the 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 way the the way people bury is metis, and it means that it's not pure. But it, the, the way they use it is there's some kind of nostalgia of a, maybe an imagined solidity in the past, but that actually never existed by definition. But but also there's, there's something that a curious pride about it, you know, that that's the way people are. So um, the, the second point that I want to make and to lead, that would lead me to my conclusion is that the kind of hybridity that is present and I knowledge uh, in, in uh, Fort Dauphin, in Anouche, in that place that, that we're discussing, is, uh, is connected to the legacies of slavery. The, and here I connect to like famous criticism of notion of hybridity. I really and colorization also when they describe the way the way of people are tend to be used in a very particular way. They tend to be able to operate as a mask to 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 hide certain hierarchical differences. 
in one of my country, France, it's very, it's very uh, striking that people, you know, people, French people do not, don't never talk about race. They hate that they, are, they can be very racist, but they will never say race. They hate that word. It thinks it's American. So the way, the 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 you no know, the the new way that people want to talk about, you know, difference, but without recognizing like legacies of domination and colonization, etc., is to say we are Creole. No, like, you know, it's everything is Creole. So that means like everything is mixed. So you don't have to worry about, you know, the legacy of domination. So it's a way, it's a tricky way of describing, you know, differences without recognizing like the, the legacy of slavery, colonization in hierarchies. And that's something that is very also, I've been studied a lot, you know, regarding Brazil and the racial democracy in Brazil. Uh, that there's a particular language about diversity that is, Try, that try to purposely hide, uh, um, you know, those those legacies. So that's also here. Um, so those contradiction, you know. My point is that if you if you if you try to to study um, to to study complexities, you you can foreground those elements, right? It's not that. It's not. It's absolutely. It's not absolutely that this is very very special. This is. Uh, this is um, what I call a frontier ethnography. And the frontier ethnography is not just about finding a place where that is the most uh, diverse and and say that, you know, it, like, you know, it's going to, the complexity is going to, um, to, to, to interview and that you just have to describe what it is. I think that there's a de deliberate intention of um, recognizing the complexity uh, not trying to reduce it, uh, not trying to make necessarily sense of it in a way that is reducing, but in a way that is like, you know, just, you know, uh, understanding the complexity and the, and the dynamics of that complexity. And uh, I think I'm, I'm going to stop because I'm more excited about having a conversation with you than just hearing my own voice. Uh, but there, there's something that I take from Edouard Glissant Edouard Glissant, as you may know, is a, is a Martinique, so a French from the Caribbean. Uh, and he, he was, he, he's, he's very famous for his work, of course, also on, on Creole societies. And there's, there's, a, there's a, when discussing agreeability, there's something that he says that I find very uh, intriguing and, uh, and also important. You know, he's talking about, you know, his scholarships as a laboratory for, of chaos. And the library of chaos is not just, you know, uh, embracing the chaos, and and but but it's, but it also is, is there's a sense of sort of like you know, let it happen in the sense that it's there's no need to there's no need to to make the chaos order. Societies can be extremely complex, and in general, if you try to find complexity, you find it. It's called historicizing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and. Uh, so to 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 finish like the kind of like frontier ethnography that I'm you know that I call for is not the the ethnography of the frontier, as you know my kind of you know introduction of Madagascar and Anush as frontier space, or kind of you know announcing it's a, it's, it's it's about you know foregrounding the diversity the complexity, and to stay away from a temptation and attempt of uh, of uh, res you know, resolving difference to just create, you know, sadness. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So much fascinating. Lots to think with. Mm -hmm. Especially for many of us who work on language and identity, clinical too. Uh, well, okay. uh, it's just fascinating, really. Interesting. Uh, my question is, I, I don't know much about Madagascar, but uh, I'll be a little bit into the sort of Cape Town and South Africa. Creolization here, I mean, you made the point about here, I'm setting a particular definition of property creolization. I might be in the reason how it creolization here basically means that Afrikaans, for example, it basically means the total history of immigration from Europe situates that up here. It suggests a series of slave, slave languages down here. And at some point in the history, you, you get a situation where a language emerges which is increasingly spoken by children, mm -hmm. as well as previously spoken, 
that we now call hovering bombs. Um, so I, I'm wondering how that, how that works in in um, in in front of me in, mm -hmm. in, in, in in the context of the French incursion into into the area there. And given the fact, it's very interesting fact that this language is linguistically mm -hmm. Asian. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how does how does that what is the point of contact and the, and the emergence of, of this, this kind of hierarchy, hierarchical power in, in, in this yeah. country? No, it's, thank you so much for this question. May I, I have a very, I need to say, I have a very bad memory. So it, it works better for me if I answer no, it. Or, yeah, because I will, I will just, you know, get lost. Sorry. So, okay, so to answer your question. So I'm going to start with the linguistic definition, but also keep in mind that there's this other definition about more, I don't know, about identity and belonging that I also want to, 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 um, to discuss after. So like the first question, the first like, you know, definition that I want to react to is very kind of an easy answer in Madagascar because there's no, there's no Creole language in Madagascar. So, and something that I may not have, I didn't insist enough on that is it's really a provocation to talk about Creole, Creole, Creoleness in Madagascar in this regard. Nobody in Madagascar considers themselves a Creole. This is not a word that is used. <laughs> Sorry, not yet. Yeah, but 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 they, so Creole. Uh, so there's no the, the the Malagashi language is not it can't be considered as Creolized, you know. And there's no French. Um, there's no French uh, Malagashi Creole. You know, like there would be like you know uh, La uh, Reunionese Creole or, um, but but Malagashi has has been element of queerization. I'm not sure, but I know there's a significant uh, um, uh, you know part of uh, of slaves that that came into uh, Cape Town that were from Madagascar. So I'm not sure what the influence of Malagashi was in in the in the era. But in Mauritius, for example, Malagashi for decades was the language of Mauritius, the language of the streets. Like when Mauritius was first uh, populated by slaves, like like the, the kind of proportion of of you know of of origins made that you know Malagashi was a language you know and and in La Réunion you'll find also a lot of um, you know a lot of name toponyms are Malagashi, so Malagashi like in other space outside of Madagascar entered in the composition of of. Creole in this linguistic way. Now coming to the definition of Creole, this is more complex about population. So like the first sense, like in the in many contexts, uh, in the Caribbean and in uh, South America and the Indian Ocean, that Creole, Creole are uh, first like the European people that are born in the colony. So you have white people that are Creole, not because they are mixed, but because they are born in the colony. So in, in Madagascar, uh, people known or know of Creole that are that, you know, they are descendants of like big plant plantation owners in La Réunion, for example, or in Mauritius. And there were a lot of them, especially also in, in, in Tanush and on the East Coast, right? Um, so, and, and the other Creoles are the, the Creoles that are mixed. So uh, the, the more common sense, even if Creole in Mauritius and Creole in La Réunion are not exactly the same, don't have the same definition, but there's also like a, a sort of um, in indication of immersion blackness, but in, in La Réunion, like mixed uh, identity. Uh, and they, in Madagascar, there were also a lot of those Creoles that people known as Creole because there were people, especially from La Réunion, that came to Madagascar during the colonization as little civil servants. And racially and culturally, they were like kind of in-betweeners, you know? They, are, they were like, you know, uh, uh, helping uh, the French to administer Madagascar, but they were also, you know, considered as kind of culturally more closer to Madagascar because of, uh, you know, maybe adding, you know, Malagashi ancestry or African ancestry in general. Um, so in that sense, you know, the Malagashi people know exactly how distinct the Creoles are from themselves. So nobody would consider themselves a Creole. When I use creolizing, it's more again as a methodological proposition, right? To say it's about, you know, foregrounding hybrid rather than you know find, trying to find pure, authentic uh, cultural traits. Yeah, I hope I answer. Yeah. 
It doesn't. It doesn't. The only because it it, it has entered, but not in a way that that created a possibility of colorization. It's in you know sometimes, it's never a first language, and sometimes and people okay so in it's it's also as like you know class and regional dynamics. So on in the in the islands where people are more um, have an education that allow them to learn more uh, French. And during the colonial period, people were speaking a lot of French and writing a lot of French. Today, it's quite different. In the South, where I work, people don't speak much French. All the people, you know, vets that have been also uh, tirailleurs, which is like they were soldiers for, for France, they, they, they maybe no more today, but 20 years ago, they were still people speaking very good French or former like colonial, colonial uh, you know, Officers or something like that that were Malagashi, but 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 and, but what is interesting and uh, you know kind of adding to what I said about the feeling of people uh, regarding their own ability and the fact that they are not pure is that in that region of Madagascar, like in the north of Madagascar, the, the region of Diego Suarez, or um, yeah, pe people people are known to like pepper their uh, Malagashi with a lot of French words. That doesn't make it a Creole. But it makes a, 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 Mal a Malagashi that sounds to other Malagashi as a bit more French. So, for for instance, so for for example, people say Métis, which is a French word instead of like using a, a Malagashi word. Uh, and they use it so much that I don't even know how you say it in Malagashi because in other regions they would have other metaphors. They would say this uh, uh, something to to. To indicate like mixing in language, people say varia uh, minananas. It's like uh, rice with herbs. Right? So it's like um, uh, something that is like you know. Uh, but but in 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 uh, for the farm they say they say metis and they would say for example once you know because I was asking him question about slaves and slavery and enslavement people always say oh yeah they, they were their colonies. Not into <laughs> that didn't mean in French you know using colonies in French they didn't mean colonies they meant slaves. So they use, you know, the, the, the word, French words that enter the vocabulary in an interesting way, you know, and I could have like, there's a lot of those examples. Mm -hmm. But then you mentioned that then the French are picked out for their their scholarship. That the end to the end of time sector of colonialism in Madagascar. So my question is related to um, does it not have the same kind of like diachronic racialization effect then in Madagascar as we, we see in places like and Rwanda? Because then yeah, it do those same kinds of remnants of, of colonialism taking up part of the event? You said about that white people in, in Madagascar aren't for the they're not Europeans but actually Asian. So I actually more just wanted to explain a bit more about that at the timeline of when when and the process of when the French colonizers okay. left and then what happens in the void construction of the language. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, and I'm I'm glad. Also, I want to say I'm very grateful to be able to speak about Madagascar uh, here because I know it's closed, but I know like it's not really well known. So it's really I, I really like appreciate like you know even having to you know yeah to present a bit more. So okay, so uh, there, there's two different things, you know. So there was never settler colonialism in Madagascar, and they were. Uh, there's a start of engagement that involves slave trade, uh, piracy. I don't know if you know David Graeber's work on pirates in Madagascar. Um, David Graeber was a, you know, his, his ethnographic work was on slavery in Madagascar, and uh, and he has worked also on, on piracy because he found, I think, like a way to discuss also, 
you know, um, variation around freedom. But, 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 you know, you know, European pirates were played also a large role in the, you know, intermixing on the East Coast. But to, to, to set the timeline, right? So first, my first sentence would be, the, the, the French, the first like colonial establishment was in Fort Dauphin, so where I'm working in the 17th century, um, middle of the century, same time as New York, Cape Town, etc. So there's a, the, the, the no, it's not the VOC there, but it's the Compagnie des Indes Orientales, so the same kind of, yeah, same kind of like, you know, uh, endeavor, uh, mercantilism, etc. And then uh, they leave after like 30 years, something like that, they are kicked out. Uh, what remains are along the coast, not just there, traders. Uh, they are like intervention by slave traders to get cattle, to get people, to bring them to La Réunion, to, Mar to, to, to Mauritius, to here. So like, and that continue, but it is no like establishment, right? And so it's a sporadic presence of traders, etc. No, there's no colonial, nothing. There's, there are tons of kingdoms in Madagascar and Pais, and, and, and the main thing that happened is the uh, uh, I, the, the imperialism that comes from the man, like the population of the of the in the in the island around the capital of the Nahif. So in the at the end of the ninth the the eighteenth century, what happened? The most important fact in Madagascar is the coming to power of Angiam Tuni Man, which is like a little sovereign in the center of Madagascar in a place called Ambui Manga that decide to create a bigger kingdom and his son and his, you know, and the people, the people in the dynasty after him decide that the limit of, he said like the limit of the rice fields is the sea. If you see the size of Madagascar, I mean like if you start from the from the center, like that's quite a lot. So he, said, he was saying the limit of my right, of my field is the city I, I want, it's like the imperial like proposition. I want to conquer everything. So there's, there's a huge, there are huge uh, uh, military campaigns that are, uh, follow, that are also, uh, you know, accompanied with atrocities, you know, like people, he, people, that it is, that, that's also the reason why French were able to create, uh, to use the resignment, you know, there's those, those memories of, you know, people being uh, treated like animals. So they would have, for example, in, it's a, it's a region where there are a lot of rights to, like in a, a lot of places in Madagascar. So in places where people had to uh, use uh, cattle to trample the rice fields before planting, they use people and they enslave people and they, 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 those are stories that people still tell, right? So they would take the, they would, they, they would um, prohibit the moms to breastfeed their kids and they would, they would make the babies um, to suck on dogs, um, you know, tits, I don't know, sorry, I'm, I'm not very good at discussing like this things in English, so sorry if I'm using like the, another word, but you understand, right? So, so this is like those trauma of the imperialism. So that happens, so this is the 19th century. The whole 19th century is imperialism, huge number of slaves, the population of the capital become like 50% slaves. 50% of the population of the capital are enslaved. They have, at the time, they are, you know, Madagascar is a bit of a, you know, up for grab, for grab. so British are interested British, like, you know, abolish slavery, et cetera, the like slave trade, the slave trade, not slavery, but the slave trade. They, they are like allies of the monarchy in, in, in Madagascar. Uh, there's stuff around Christianization, non christianization et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, at some point, Madagascar and uh, French and, and, and Great Britain decide that they are going to, you know, to approach, to, to, you know, to, uh, I don't know, you know to distribute, you know, the, the Indian Ocean. So the um, French say, French are, you know, are going to say, you know, my guy says for us. So that's in the, in 1884 is the start of the campaigns, the military campaigns in Madagascar. Uh, and, and in uh, 19, 1896, finally is the uh, protection. No, it's, it's like the annexion of Madagascar. It's not yet, it's not, Simply the protectorate is Madagascar become a French colony, but it's never going to become a settler colony. It's an, it's an extractive place, place for extraction. So this administrator is mostly direct rule, but a lot of also indirect rule in places that are on the coast and not that easily governed and um, um, forced labor, et cetera, et cetera, and until the independence in 1960. 
and I don't, I, <laughs> I forgot. Okay, Russianization, right, that's, that's important. So before, so I, I, I shouldn't, I, I want to go back because, okay, this, this, um, this illustration is from uh, the governor of Fort Dauphin in the 17th century. And it shows the hierarchy, there's something about the hierarchy there. So the white people that you see there, and this is, okay, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, or you are with the production of books uh, in 17th century, but the way they were doing it is that like there would, would be somebody who come back with a journal uh, chronicle about, you know, their time abroad. And then they would ask an artist, can you make a, can you make, you know, an illustration? Of course, the people I didn't know, so sometimes, some were better than others, but sometimes it looks like it's in Athens, you know, they, like the way they are dressed, is, it's nothing alike. They just try to imagine what it is. So that's what happened there. So do not, it's not a photo, as you know. <laughs> but what you see there are two categories of people. Those are white people that are called Futsi. They are from the dynasty of the Zaframinia. The Zaframinia where I arrived in Madagascar in Anush, in Madagascar probably in the 11th century, in Anush in the 13th century. They are, they say, they are Muslim. They, they, in Madagascar, in Madagascar, there's Islam. They, they say that they are, they come from Mecca. They are the children of Zahaminia. They say it's the, the, I don't know, the son in, uh, son in law of the prophet, something like that. You know? There's different stories, but basically, there's they are, they, they are called Futsi, which is in white in, in Malagashi. So at the time, Futsi, Futsi is, is a category. Then it's, those, are, those people are supposed to be Arabic, but it could have been, sometimes there have been Indians called Futsi. Sometimes they were, they were Asian. So Futsi is a category as a racial category, right? It's a category, but it's not necessarily a phenotype. But it's kind of like this fair skin, something like that, right? And the the other people are called Menti Black, and they are mostly of you know they, they are mostly of African descent, but they also could have been it's unsure. They could there's a lot of people with darker skin in Asia, so it's not a question of where they are from, but it's a question of like more you know lighter skin, more darker skin. It's not it's not. It doesn't, and it's also like the history of racialization in Europe. It's not yet what we what we think about, you know, re, uh, modern race, right? And people people don't say that people are inferior because of the color of their skin. They definitely identify as black and white, but there's plenty of other categories. But mostly, it's religion. The 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 claim to power is Islam. They are better than others, and they have a right to the absolute sovereign because they are Muslim, because they are superior in terms of culture, because they have they impose a right to, to the Sumbil, what we call Sumbil in Malagashi, which is to ritually um, uh, uh, slaughter the cattle. And the, ki the kings and the dynasty do that for everybody. So that's, and there, okay, so that's what happened here. There are many other, that's why it's fascinating. There are many other uh, configuration, cultural configuration in Madagascar. This is one of them. With like the particular people that were uh, that came, and uh, uh, you know, mind you, before the before the Zaframia, there were other like people from other uh, that were also Muslim for a, a couple of centuries that have other Muslim uh, genealogies, and that also had different history of powers, and there are different particularities. Some people, some of those migrants, had no claim to create a, you know kingdoms and and etc. Some of them. Add, you know, so it's it, there are diverse, you know, uh, people from diverse places, but race is not major there, it's religion. And then it's, uh, it, but there's also, of course, the incursion of Europeans that, you know, from the Portuguese in the 16th century to, you know, the French and the Dutch, etc., that are presence and more and more and more. And then slavery, enslavement, it become more important, more pressure, indentured labor, like in, after the abolition of slavery, they see indentured labor that are taken to Mauritius from there. Until like, I think the last ship of indentured labor, that's of course illegal, or kind of in gray zone, is leaving in, the, in 1920, 1928 or something like that. And so the moment when race be, become kind of sort of similar to what's happening everywhere else in the world, probably in the 19th century, the images of natural science and the natural discourse on race, uh, the, that racialization comes with the colonization. And then, and then there's, there's something that existed before, before around 
an history of difference, an history of inequality, enslavement, kingdoms, imperialism, that become like, that there's a switch and it becomes translated in, in, in racial categories. When it's, when, it's, when it's activated by the French and the great they has, when it's engineered in that way. And of course, like what's happening in Rwanda, in Burundi, it's kind of the same doctrine, right? And I believe Gagnini is not for nothing because he was very influential in the, in the European colonialism. So what, what, what happened is that it, it become a little, a little song that is played all over, and then it's played in many different ways. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a, you know, the, 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 at the time, what is called the FTSE, especially in the capital, they are the Austrian Asian, like people who are of, like, apparent, seemingly Austrian Asian descent. They are the people that were the kings of that empire that dominated and enslaved others. So now it, it, it becomes that association. Those white people, they are enslavers, right? They are enslavers. Uh, and and uh, and what is interesting is that what uh, France has done in many ways, they say, we abolish slavery. Those were the enslavers. The, the, the people who re resisted because the people who lost a lot, who lost their empires, were the men, that the, the, the population in the capital. And I'm kind of simplifying if there's anybody like, that is seeing that on Teams, uh, on Zoom, that is that, you know, I'm just simplifying a bit, but that's what happened. And, and the, the, the moment, there's two moments that are very interesting. The, the colonial resistance, you know, around 47, for example, when this huge massacre of Malagashi by France, 100,000 people died in the colonial massacre. One of the largest, uh, more uh, terrible colonial massacre in, in Africa happened there. In 47, it's, 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 a, it's a repression of an independence movement that starts with people that you could say were white, like in that sense, FTSE. And uh, the way that also the French at the time, so long, many decades after Gagnini, are able to mobilize descendants of slaves and black people in Madagascar against the white people, like white people that are not European, right? It's by saying those people, if they go, if they come back, they, they say they want independence, but actually if they come back too far, they are going to enslave you again. Remember what they did, six, what, or you were 60 years before, they are going to do that again. So they pit people against each other in that way. And like one of the first iteration of a party of black people, it's called like the PADES, the, the uh, party, uh, it's a kind of like, you know, a party of the excluded and the black people. It's, it's a, a kind of a colonial intervention to, to encourage the creation of a political party that's going to fight against the independentists. So it's, it's a very Machiavellian thing that happened. And, uh, and after the independence, there's a lot of reiteration of that. And it's very interesting when you look at uh, Malagashi politics in the capital and the region to understand how often those categories are mobilized, you know, uh, in, in, in many ways, again, today. So it's, but definitely, there's no question. Those categories, they were, they were uh, uh, invented, they were strengthened by colonial illustrator and colonial uh, uh, science. Another example is just that, for example, today there's an there's a equivalence between like black and slaves. The darker you are, the more likely you, uh, you are to, have been, to, or to be a descendant of slaves. That was never the case before. Like, just most of the people that were enslaved and brought to La Réunion, for example, or to probably to, to the Western Cape, were not people that looked like they were uh, African, Black Africans. They were people that looked like they were from, from, from Malaysia or Indonesia. That's also probably, that's one of my hypotheses also why, you know, Malagashi people have been also absorbed in the category that, you know, lump them together with people from also from Asia here. And why you never hear that, you know, a, they were at some point, you know, at the peak of the trade, there were 30% of people that were from Madagascar, right? Sorry, thank you so much. That was really amazing. I've been trying to understand Madagascan society with my own research, historical research on enslaved Madagascans in uh, Cape Town. Um, I, I, I've got so much I want to say, so I'm going to quote where I'm going to put it. Just firstly, to begin with the question, um, 
and it's it's an issue around creolization as we think about it perhaps in Madagascar. But the question is with the Malagasy language, I know there was single language with many dialects. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I understood it, it was really coming from the Marina Empire, the, the, the Malagasy language and the domination of that language as a kind of pure Malagasy. Is that correct? No. Okay. No, everybody. So everybody, they, they, I'm not saying that, okay, because of the, the way it was populated, and it's a very, I'm just uh, um, asking, responding to that because it's very quick. Like for centuries, for as far as we have documentation on, like everybody was speaking Malagashi, a dialect of Malagashi in Madagascar. The only thing is that with the imperialism, there were probably like a, uh, like an imposition of certain and an influence of the kind of Malagashi that people in Imerni were speaking. But they were already speaking their version of Malagashi, and it, there, there's still a lot of dialects that are very different. But they, the Malagashi was there everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So the follow-up question is yeah. that. Talking about the large numbers of Malagasy who were enslaved and forced to pay politically by the VOC mm -hmm. from like, the 1680s right up to um, the early 19th century, which is my research. I'm looking at a population of Malagasy people living in on the plantation space around you, what we call Newlands now. And they had a presence there from and the in the slave lodge as well for over a hundred years. But the the, and they, I mean, they weren't dispersed as other Malagasy's were within a large households and farms and mm -hmm. stuff where they were part of multiple um, other ethnicities that were there. Yet there, there, there wasn't this development of a kind of Malagasy community. Um, and certainly from 1790, which is the archival material I'm looking at, the entire plantation uh, in their population was half Malagasy, half Mozambique, or well, let's say coming from the yeah. of Mozambique. Um, and the fascinating thing for me has been is, is, is kind of challenging the notion of creolization that people like the Robert Shell spoke mm -hmm. about in terms of the creolization of the enslaved population and showing the, the practices of domination and violence and, and violent enculturation that actually went in the slave lodge to take away Languages mm -hmm. to take away religion, the, the pressure. The children were literally taken away from parents at three years old, um, and and put into the Dutch school at the, at the lodge. And there also was this huge necessity to baptize your children, um, because if you didn't, your family was, was could be split up. And, and and the records of how Malagasy and Mozambican families were split, who had not baptized their children. So in the South African context, at least, the whole disappearance of the secrecy wow. around Madagascar is very interesting. And they're, and they're very interesting. There were actual practices which aculturalized and, and took away identity, which are not realization. Yeah. The kind of, I mean, when I say understand realization would be relationships of extreme domination. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. And thank you. And like, I, I'm, you know, I'm. I want to hear a lot more because you answer a question that I have, but I don't know. I know this, this, I know like some of the work that has been done, like Nigel Ward, et cetera, on, on the presence of Malagashi states, but I, I, I don't know as much because I'm not an historian and I, and this is not something that, you know, even people working on Malagasy have done much, done much about that. Historians, yes. I have my colleague that is also a specialist of Mozambique slaves in Madagascar that knows those things very well. Because she's that's part of her, you know, that's what she encountered in the archives as an anthropologist. I'm it's, I'm not very I wasn't very familiar with it. Like when I when I went to the slave lodge for the first time in 2016, I looked at I looked at the name, I was like, I <laughs> I know those names, they're Malagashi. Yeah, but it's, it's I'm very interested. I, I don't so I don't have much comment on the history because that's your uh, that's your expertise. Uh, and I find, you know, I, I will, uh, I, I want to learn more about that new lens and Malagashi stays there. What I want to say, maybe, maybe to address queerization, there's something, okay, of course, like queerization is like, in, this, in, the, in the sense of describing a process, not the epistemology that I'm talking about, is of course like legacy of, of violence, right? But I love what Edouard Glissant is saying. He's saying like, queerization is not the project of enslavement. The project of enslavement, of enslavement is erasure, is the fact to 
uh, subjugate people. And one of the ways to subjugate people, of course, is to uh, remove their name, separate lineages, uh, make genealogy disappear to make people not be human anymore so that you can use them. Um, so it's a death. But what this one is saying, creation is the project of post-slavery societies. So creation come and the kind of interest also in what we gain together is not something that that become you know at the moment of the of the of the enslavement. It's certainly not from the people who are the masters, but it comes from after, after. And in places like the Caribbean, or where people suddenly say, "Are we are we African? Are we like Native American? Are we this and that?" And then discovering, and that's of of course those movement that, for example, like um, like in in uh, uh, French Caribbean, there's something. Yeah, like people, like I have some, a few, a few authors have come with that terms antillanity, like the, the 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 kind of cultural characteristic of being from those places. That is that is a reaction uh, against, for example, negritude movement that were more essentially about something about Africanity that you keep everywhere, about blackness that you keep everywhere. You know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar. I'm talking to more to the younger. Public, but like people, you know, who like Sangor or Aimé Césaire that have um, discussed, you know, like the kind of essential quality of blackness that you would find in Africa, but also in the diaspora. The the kind of more like colonization oriented authors from uh, the Caribbean islands, from French Caribbean islands, have insisted on the fact that their identity and sense of belonging doesn't come from doesn't come from recognition of essentialized identity, but actually from the mixing itself. So that claim, and th that's a project in a way that Grisson is talking about. There's a project that is maybe intellectual or social that has to do, to do with what do we do after slavery? So I, 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 I recognize and acknowledge you know, your uh, recognition that what's happening in the moment of enslavement, it's not like harmonious racial mixing and cultural mixing. That's not what happened. That's erasure and death. I found it really compelling, you know, how you are kind of actually rehabilitating hybridity and even the self and identity. But I see that two things happen. On the one hand, taking hybridity away, away from this idea of just a mixing, mm -hmm. right? Where you retain this question of power, but then also historicizing identity in a way that doesn't dissolve the category, mm -hmm. right? So, so I didn't, so I mean, I remember now, right? The critique of hybridity, mm -hmm. while you still retain the idea of these two parts. But then also as if these are no ideas, that one critique and the other yeah. idea, as if they are equal, right? The European part of the set. People critique as a push of idea, you know, how we Baba comes up with. And in fact, we're having you know, Tuesday, uh, he's coming to Stellenbosch. Um, yeah, but and often what happens with historicizing is we historicize identity to the point where they don't exist. Right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like there's something here about the way that you are historicizing but still allowing for the for, for, for the purchase of certain kinds of identities even as they transform mm -hmm. and are never really that whole that whole anyway does that have something to do with how what you're suggesting about this frontier um in the sense of i don't know dwelling in chaos yes is there I, I added well you didn't say well but yeah. there was some sense of you know like almost a methodological of yes yeah, because I think that, okay, so also what I wanted to do by also describing, and I had to do that a bit fast because I was too long before, but like when I, when I wanted to discuss, you know, like uh, the perception that everything is mixed by the people themselves, I want also to consider like even like uh, in a phenomenological way or experiential way, what it means for you know, what it means in those places, right? So that's my ethnographic uh, practice, but but also like as an analy analytical tool, it's, it's, yeah, it's like that laboratory of chaos, like staying there in the, the discomfort of not saying that it's one or the other. And, and, and I feel, I, you know, personally, I feel very comfortable in chaos. I feel comfortable not 
responding uh, and not wa wanting to to create to make everything into a dialectic and like a like you know nicely you know a written thing. So okay. yeah. Yeah, good luck on your future endeavors. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank well, we, uh, yeah, for those of you, I think we got the email. You're welcome to join at three o'clock. We'll continue the conversation. Thanks. <laughs>